Mmh. Et après C'est compliqué, hein Mais pourtant... Euh, parce que normalement, c'est Ghislaine devrait être... Et linguistiquement, ça serait plus correct. Mais donc, GH, c'est G. Mais oui, mais donc c'est une question pour le nom, pour, le nom, pour votre nom, ou c'est vous qui vous... C'est ma maman qui a décidé ça, qui a trouvé ça, que c'était plus doux. Alors maintenant... C'est Ghislaine. Voilà. Je suis désolée. Non, non, c'est <rire> Mais de, de Anne Lambert, par contre, il faudrait dû savoir. <rire> Parce que les deux viennent de Belgique. Oui, de Anne, c'est flamand, de Roubaix, et Flambert, c'est wallon. Ouais, mon grand-père était euh, de Wallonie. Enfin, c'est plutôt allemand, c'est juste sur la frontière avec l'Allemagne, c'est la partie qui est, ouais, qui est contre l'Allemagne. Ah, les, les langues, c'est compliqué. <rire> Il a... ouais, bon, attends, ils n'ont pas fait sécession comme la Catalogne, c'est déjà ça. Ouais, ouais. Mais il paraissait fou, heureusement. Ok. So, no. Not right. I was... Oh, completely black. Ok, I thought it was a change. Not yet. Ok. I know it's very tiring <laughs> to interpret. Oh, okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture hosted by Gallaudet University. Welcome to those here and also to those that are connected remotely and are following us uh, through their internet. This lecture series aims to honor world-renowned scientists in the fields of psychology, education, cognitive sciences, and neuroscience. The different field, the, these different fields and the interdisciplinary fields in between contribute to the new and growing field of educational neuroscience. They increase our understanding of the human mind and the neural mechanisms of learning. This year's Distinguished Lecture Series theme is The Origin and Nature of Language, Numeracy, and Thought. With our Distinguished Lectures in the heart of DC, we want to build bridges across fields and scientific communities and in the DC area and across the nation. Everyone is welcome to attend in person here and we also hope then many may enjoy these exceptional presentations wherever they are through our streaming service. Today, we have an, the honor and pleasure of welcoming Dr. Gislaine de Anne Lambert. Thank you for coming. Dr. de Anne Lambert is the scientific director of the Developmental Neuroimaging Lab at Neurospin, one of the world's most prestigious imaging centers dedicated to the human brain located in Paris. Originally a pediatrician, she has decided to pursue her research studying the development of cognitive functions in infants and children using brain imaging techniques. Her research goal is to study the brain initial and primitive structural and functional organizations in order to understand how it may support later complex cognitive functions such as language, music, mathematics, and more. In turn, she also investigates how the environment shapes the brain organization to reach a mature state. Her pioneering work studying language acquisition in infants with new techniques such as high-density ERPs, fMRI, or optical topography has impacted the field of developmental neuroscience. 
If you measure her scientist career by her publication, she holds an astonishing record of over 170 publications, with several published in the most prestigious journals, such as Science, Nature, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Her work has been cited over 13,000 times. She has also been recognized nationally and internationally through many prestigious awards. Among others, she was awarded the Grand Prix Scientifique from the Foundation of France in 2015 and the Scientific Prize from the Energy Foundation Institute of France 2016. Today, we will learn more about infants' brains and their precursors of language with her talk. And without more ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ghislaine de Han Lambert. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and uh, to, uh, for the first time, come in the Gallaudet University, which is uh, close to the heart of French people because um, of the history of sign language in France and, and here. So we will begin uh, this talk on language to, to speak about the infant because um, I think that an interesting, sorry, it would be difficult at start. An <laughs> uh, interesting aspect of infant is that in fact they are the only uh, architecture, neural architecture, that show uh, language abilities. So if we can understand how their brain is working, we may be able to understand how language has emerged in our species. So it's why I am so interested in, in, in language. And you can see here my favorite part of the brain. I don't know if you can recognize it because it's a little bit uh, a funny way of presentation, but you have here the superior uh, temporal sulcus along which you see a lot of uh, language activation when you put other subjects in MRI. And uh, uh, on the front here, the inferior frontal region or, bro or Broca area, in which, which is also a very important region in language. So I will explain in a few slides why it is colored like that. So, if you look at the language capacities of children, they are quite amazing. Before the end of the first year of life, they, are, they show very uh, important capacities to analyze the speech stream. So I will give you like a, a, a list of their possibilities just to give you the, the, the real impression of what they are able to do. So they can... Um, they know what are the sound uh, of their own language and how they are combined in, in, in words. They are sensitive to short and long distance dependency uh, in a speech stream and just after a few minutes of exposure they can uh, show this sensitivity. They distinguish open and closed class words using their acoustic and distributional properties in sentences. And at the end of the first year they know already a little bit about closed class words and open class words. They are able to extract words from the speech stream before they understand their meaning. They understand also the referential aspect of speech. And there is a recent paper showing that they know around four months of age that speech convey information. They begin to associate words and meaning, a few words like uh, the body parts, mummy, daddy, uh, around six months of age. And they also display capacities of abstract computation. They are sensitive to abstract rules, such as AAB, ABA. If you have a list of syllabic words following this structure, they are able to distinguish the two list of words. And they can use words to discover or represent uh, object categories. So it's quite amazing if you look at what they are also able to do relatively to production. They produce only a few words. They, their babbling is affected by the native language, but only in the second semester of life. And when you look at what they are able to do in other way, in other um, um, domain, like the motor domain, they work only around 15 months, and they go down the stairs without help uh, uh, at, uh, what I say, two years of age, not two months. <laughs> So it's quite amazing um, how uh, huge 
their linguistic capacities are relatively to other, uh, um, other capacities, and especially their, uh, uh, and, uh, their uh, perception capacity. So the questions we can have is how do they succeed? What is in their brain? What is the functional architecture of their brain that, that uh, can give them these possibilities? How similar it is to the adult organization? And uh, finally, uh, if we understand what part of the brain is doing what of these capacities, can that help us to understand uh, how they, are, they, proceed, they proceed to, uh, um, to uh, acquire their native language? And thanks to the development of the non-invasive brain imaging technique, we now have a, a large bunch of techniques to study their brain. So we have, for example, high density EG, MEG. We can have MRI and uh, near infrared spectroscopy. And all these techniques now uh, allow us to look directly in their brain and try to understand how they will proceed, proceed language, sentences, uh, uh, syllables, and uh, other things. So, but before to enter uh, in what brain imaging show us, I just want to show you a little bit of facts about brain development. Because it's not that the, the infant brain is just a small adult brain. It's a very different brain. In the sense that, uh, for example, if you look at what is happening during uh, the last trimester of gestation, I suppose I should go here. You have this big increase in size that you can see here and you can have also here with the gyration of the brain, which is related to the fact that the neurons which are in the center of the brain will go outside to the periphery. And um, so a baby can be born around, uh, so the youngest babies that our preterm term are around uh, 26 weeks of gestation. As at this age, you have more neuron not in place under the cortex that you have neuron in the cortex. And during this last period of the gestation, these neurons are going to construct the six layers of the cortex and to make connection between, between them. After birth, you have another... Um, and during childhood, you have a progressive refinement of this neural architecture. And, uh, but it's not going at the same speed in all brain areas. Some brain areas, like the visual cortex, are developing very fast after birth. So you have here a calendar of the myelination of the, uh, of the brain. And you see that the optic radiation are myelinating from birth until, uh, so mainly during the first trimester of life. And you see also the same uh, maturation, fast maturation in the visual cortex due to the uh, increase of, of synaptic density in that cortex. If you look at the auditory system, it's maturing um, uh, slower during the, the first two years of life with this, uh, it's like you can see also here, see here in, I suppose, purple, and uh, some other region, like the high um, uh, level region, like the frontal cortex or the parietal cortex, they are maturing very late. The frontal cortex is here in uh, brown, and you see the corticocortical associative fibers, which are maturing until puberty. So you, that means that this brain here, that you see here at one uh, month of age, have some parts which are like here in yellow or in red, very mature, and some other parts which are in blue, which are very immature. It's not that you have a homogeneous immature brain, it's that you have a very, you have different parts of the brain which are at different states of maturation. So that give a complex uh, dynamic within that brain, very different from what we see in adults. So how this brain can learn. So there are two classical hypotheses. The first one said, okay, only mature areas are working in a baby. So it means that, for example, if we look at this uh, 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 one-month-old baby image, 
on these uh, more uh, primary areas will work and you will develop language as this other blue region will become mature. That was the first idea. Second idea was that in fact this brain is very uh, non-specific. Everything is connected with everything, so everything is working together. And what will happen during uh, development is that you will specify more and more uh, some region or the other. And what I want to show today is that, in fact, none of this uh, uh, hypothesis is true. But you have, from start, very specialized network. And es especially, you have a very asymmetrical uh, network, like in adults, you do not have an equipotential brain. And you have also not at all this bottom-up sequence of maturation that follow uh, um, cognitive function that will follow this bottom-up uh, sequence of maturation. But high-level regions are involved since start. So everything is working since start, which is not surprising. You cannot imagine that your frontal cortex will not work. You have a piece of meat which is just in behind your, your front and it will stay like that waiting till, uh, to be mature to work now. So in fact everything is working from start and what is interesting is what type of computation to have for example frontal region involved in, uh, in uh, cognition will give to the baby for him to learn, to learn uh, language or some other uh, capacities. So just to give you some evidence about the early asymmetries in the human brain. So first, at the um, macrostructural level. When you look at a human brain, it, does, it is a very asymmetric brain. And you know, maybe if some people here have worked with brain imaging, that you have this uh, bending of the right hemisphere above the left, which is called the um, Yakovlan torque. So it means that the right hemisphere is a little bit higher and in front of the left hemisphere. It's something which is already present in other primates. It's already present in uh, uh, gorilla and chimpanzee. But you have some other asymmetries. For example, if you look at the sulcation, how these sulci appear during gestation. Usually, they appear uh, on the right side before the left side. And you can see here that the superior temporal sulcus, so this very important region for language, is uh, present on this baby on the right side, while there is no, nothing on the left. And we are here at 27 weeks of gestation, meaning around six months of gestation. So you are three months before term. And you have another baby here, 29 weeks, so two weeks later, and still you can see that he has uh, the uh, superior temporal sulcus on the right, but not on the left. And when you look, you can say, okay, that's preterm. Maybe it's not like that in, uh, uh, fetus, in fetuses. But in fact, now we can have images within um, the... Uh, how do you say that in English? Oh, you will say that in... Uh, <laughs> inside the, the, the uterus. You, uh, you can see here the uh, difference in the convexity of this brain. I don't know. Do you see, uh, is that uh, the colors are visible from, uh, from where you are? OK. Because from what, where I am, I do not see very well. OK. So um, you can see that the difference uh, between the left and the right curvature, so the, what is happening is that the uh, left planum temporale is uh, more marked. Uh, the planum temporale is more marked on the left. And the STS is deeper on the right. And it gives you this blue, uh, red, uh, colors here and that is uh, where it is the uh, significance the difference between left and right and you see that in fact when you look at this brain the posterior temporal region is very asymmetric both related to the planum temporale in red and to the superior temporal circus in uh, 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 blue so it's true in infants so what you got here is uh, the, the depth of these two sulcus on the right in blue and in, uh, uh, on the left in, uh, in red. And you see in infants, it's what I said, not only this superior temporal sulcus is appear, uh, appearing earlier on the right side, but it is deeper and stay deeper. It's still true in children, it's true in adults, and there is only one population here who do not show it, 
it's a chimpanzee. So it's the first, in fact, uh, asymmetries only present in your human species. And more importantly, it's present on, in almost all children. So 96% of the subjects. If you have adults, infants, fetuses, children, and even pathology like uh, corpus callosum agenesia, or Klinefelter syndrome, we look at a lot of pathologies and everybody, uh, almost everybody, has these asymmetries. And why it, it is interesting? Because the superior temporal sulcus is important for two functions. On the right, for social cognition, and on the left, for language. And I don't know how you, <laughs> uh, Laurent, you, you should appreciate this difference because you have a lot of things to say about this region. And when you look at meta-analysis of phonetic processing uh, studies, you see that the center of mass of all this, uh, of the activation in all these studies looking at phonetic processing is exactly in the same region that these uh, uh, asymmetries. So it's just a macrostructural marker. I, don't, I do not say that you need to have a deeper SCS to do something with language, but it's just a, a very uh, a big change between us and the chimpanzee, and it maybe uh, represents some of the change that give us the possibility to have a language. If you look to now the microstructural uh, composition of the brain, as I said, the brain will mature during, the first, during infancy and after that childhood. And you can see directly on the T2 images, on the MRI. And uh, if you look at some part like here, for example, you have the calcarine uh, seizures, so the, vis the primary visual areas, and they are very dark relatively to the other part of the brain. And you have the same thing for the Eschel gyrus, which is dark here, and for uh, the central sulcus that we see here. It's more darker than the other part. Why? Because this part, uh, this uh, part I just uh, pointed at, they are maturing fast at this uh, period, uh, at this age, and so the water is less... Uh, there is less water and the signal is darker when you use MRI. And so you can use and color that by uh, taking this uh, 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 value of the T2 signal. And you can have nice images like that in which in each voxel we know uh, the maturation. And you can see here that on the right side, the superior temporal sulcus, so you see from the top, is much uh, redder than on the left, so it at three months at three weeks of age, but also at 14 weeks. And in fact, we got these asymmetries at the right superior temporal sulcus is maturing faster than the left. Again, it's an observation. I don't know why it's useful, but you have a difference again between left and right. Another thing that you can measure uh, with MRI is the tract, so the, the connection between two regions. It's uh, uh, in the white matter. And uh, you can measure how it matures because it will also affect uh, water in the images and so the, what you can measure uh, with, for example, DTI. And there is an important tract which connects the temporal and the frontal region, so an, a tract which is important in language, which is the arcuate fasciculus. This fasciculus is almost not present in, uh, uh, in macaque, you see it, it's the dorsal pathway here. It's very thin in macaque, a little bit bigger in chimpanzee, and huge in humans. And you can see here in adults, this huge tract of fibers that connect the frontal areas and the temporal areas. You have it also in babies, you see it here in purple. And in adults, it is asymmetric. It's much more important in the left side than on, in the right. And what we get in babies is also an asymmetry. So we measure with diffusion tensor imaging, it's an MRI technique, um, the maturation with a, a parameter which is called uh, anisotropy fractional, or fractional anisotropy, sorry. Anisotropy. <laughs> so FA. <laughs> and you see that uh, this FA is uh, uh, more important on the left than in the right in this part, and it's another study in which we found it again. What does it mean? It means either that the arcuate is more 
uh, compact on the left side than on the right, or is more myelinated on the left side than on the right. But again, we have an asymmetry in the linguistic uh, system. So in fact, all these babies have been uh, studied during the first semester of life. You see that you have all a lot of asymmetries which are not uh, present like that in other animals. So you have structural asymmetry, the planum temporale, which is larger on the left than on the right. This uh, new asymmetry uh, that we uh, discover with MRI on the STS. You have these maturational differences, either in the gray matter or in the white matter. And that's a, um, a very interesting fact that uh, we know already in mammals that you have a gradient of maturation. Even in the mice, all the brain of the mice is not maturing at the same speed. But usually what you have in animals is a dorsal ventral gradient and an anteroposterior gradient. And what can be a new fact in humans is now the, you have left-right differences. And that, if you have differences of maturation, it means that you will be differently sensitive to the environment. And that may explain some of uh, um, what we see uh, in, uh, in humans. But all of that is anatomy. So do we have functional asymmetries? We know that in, uh, in adults, you will process language on the left side and more emotional aspects, social aspects on the right side. So can we see things like that already in babies? So if you look at MRI and you make babies, so two or three months old babies listening to uh, sentences, you see that they are activating only the pericidian areas, but all the pericidian areas. So something which is very similar to adults, uh, temporal, superior temporal sulcus, and the inferior frontal region here. And uh, in these two studies, we found already asymmetries at the level of the planum temporale. So this posterior part, again, of uh, the temporal region. But you must say, OK, you just uh, show us that there is a symmetry of maturation. So whatever stimuli you will present, they will show, they will uh, display this asymmetry. It's not true. Because in that study, we present to two months old either their mother voice, the mother of the previous baby voice, so it was an unknown voice for the, the baby tested, and music. And you can see that for the two voices, you have more activity in the left planum temporale than in the right. But it was not true for the music. So it's really an asymmetry which is related to language and not a general asymmetry. And here I want to present you first the experiment and see how uh, babies are doing that type of experiment. So I suppose that I should be, the sound is not working. so. I will do not. Well, I will. I will make the sound. <laughs> so, in fact, what the baby is doing is <laughs> seeing a face which is doing here e movement. So, and here is listening to a vowel which can be a or e. So, a here and uh, which is said either by a man or a woman. And so for the moment, you see woman face. And so you will have two types of mismatch. Either the uh, voice, the, the gender of the voice will be congruent or not with the uh, gender of the face. And the vowel, the auditory vowel, will be congruent or not with the face. And I don't know if you have seen the baby, but he was very interested <laughs> first. And he was trying to also to articulate and to produce what he was listening to. And he was big, um, doing some, uh, some noise which were related to, uh, to, the, uh, to what he was uh, listening and seeing. So that's the design of the experiment. So either they see a male face or a female face doing a A movement or E movement. And after that, the face disappears and they uh, listen or hear the vowel. And we are looking whether uh, 
to the ERP response, to, to the evoked response by the vowel uh, R or E. So the vowel can be congruent or not with, with the face. And what we record with ERP is a mismatch response. So when it was, uh, sorry, when the vowel was not congruent with the articulatory movement, or when the gender of the voice was not congruent with the gender of the face. And you see that these two responses first are occurring at the same time, so it's not the same type of trials, meaning that these both uh, features are computed in parallel. And furthermore, they have not the same topography, meaning that it's not the same region which are working at the same time. That it means that, like in other primates, we are computing a lot of uh, properties on what we are listening to. So when you are uh, listening to somebody, or seeing somebody, you are doing a lot of things. You are uh, listening to me, you are seeing uh, uh, the, the movement, you are uh, uh, uh <coughs> computing whether I am a, a woman or a man, if I am happy or not happy, if I am stressed or not stressed, etc. So all of these computations are done in parallel. And it's what we see here in babies. So they are computing both in parallel the, uh, the gender, so the, who is the speaker, and what he's saying. And what is more interesting is that it's not when you are trying to, 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 to figure out what, what are the brain area activated by this uh, 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 computation. You see that when it's on the left, for, it is on the left for a phonetic change, and it is on the right for a voice change. So it's rough localization because we are using ERP here and not uh, MRI. But <coughs> you see that you have a, a different uh, hemispheric response depending of the type of computation which is done uh, with the vowel. And in MRI now, uh, back to the study with the mother voice and the unknown mother voice, we can look at what uh, part of the brain are separating the mother voice and the, uh, the unknown mother voice. And you see that we have also a left-right distinction. Here on the left, you have a stronger response for the mother voice. And in some posterior temporal sulcus, again, the same region, which is involved in phonological uh, processing. So better encoding of the phonology for a familiar voice. While on the right, you see <coughs> that you have, in fact, a, a negative bot response for uh, the mother voice relatively to the unknown. And this region is interesting because it's also the same region which has been found here by uh, uh, Blasi and collaborators in seven-month-old babies, which were distinguishing between uh, vocalization and non-voice uh, noise. And it's also the same region in adults um, implied uh, when they have to recognize voices. So, beyond all these anatomical asymmetries, you have also functional asymmetries, like maybe the message and the messenger are processed by, uh, differently by both hemispheres with different bias, uh, hemispheric biases. Yeah. How do you say that in biases? <laughs> But you can say you are looking at babies already the, during the first trimester of life, they are already old. So maybe all those effects are related to their environment. So with the Fabrice Valois and Madi Mahmoudzadeh, we went back to the onset of this uh, uh, baby, of these maps, of this organization. And we study uh, preterm babies at six months of gestation. So uh, they were 31 weeks of gestation old. You can see they are very small. They can hold in a hand. Their brain is very smooth, um, very different from an adult brain. And remember what I said at the start of this conference, the neurons are, most of them are under the, the, the cortex. They are not in place. So you are very, very immature state. And when you look at the EEG, when you record their brain activity, it's what is called the tracé alternant in French, um, in which you have bursts of activity followed by long periods of electrical silence. 
does not mean that nothing is happening, but you see a big difference between period of activity and period of almost flat responses. So, to these very young babies, we use near-infrared uh, spectroscopy to be able to test them directly in their incubator to avoid to move them to any, uh, any location. And um, they had block of syllables in which either the syllables was uh, always repeated, ba, 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 or with a change of phoneme, ba, 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 ga, or a change of voice, ba, 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 ba. It was a male and a female voice. And so what you will look here is the response on the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere. We record only in the colored part. So it's why you have uh, white uh, around the green part. And uh, OK, you will see what happens. So the sound starts now when you have the, the red. And you see the big response here in the left and right hemisphere for the change of phoneme relatively to the standard situation and the uh, uh, voice mismatch blocks. And now everything is finishing. You still have an activity a little bit here. So just to show you uh, better what we, we got. So now you have the time series recorded from the temporal region. In uh, red, you have the response for a change of phoneme. And you have two, two uh, lines for each uh, color, which corresponds to the six oldest and the six youngest babies, meaning they have two weeks of difference to see whether there was a change. And there is no change. Forget about the two, the two lines. But you see on the temporal areas how uh, the, um, they are responding to a change of phoneme, both on left and right. On the frontal areas, you have a response for a change of phoneme, and only for a change of phoneme on the left side, while on the right side, you have a response for both change, a change of phoneme and a change of voice. Meaning two things here, that three months before term, really when we are at start, and here they are tested, they are during their first week of life. So it's very young babies. They have already uh, the minimum first, the minimum neural circuitry to react to, uh, um, to the world, which is quite in interesting because uh, you, you could have expected uh, that nothing would happen. Uh, as you have seen, we have response not only in the primary areas, but it's going far along the superior temporal region and also to the frontal region. Um, the temporal cues are perceived better than the spectral cues, meaning that the babies were reacting to the change of phoneme much stronger than to a change of voice. And we had a second experiment with uh, uh, ERP, so with EEG, and we have the same type of response because you can have said, okay, here with near infrared spectroscopy, you can record only under the, the diode, so under where we put the, the, the systems to record. And we may have missed response from other parts of the brain. But, but with the EG, you record everything, and we have exactly the same type of response. That, that is a big response for a change of phoneme and a very immature response for a change of voice. While we did the same experiment in rats, and in fact, they were responding more for the change of, of voice. Because the change of voice is very important relatively to the very tiny change that you get for bar to ga, which is done in 40 milliseconds. So it's a very brief and difficult uh, phonetic uh, contrast. So it means that really the human brain is uh, prepared to uh, um, process these temporal cues, and it's very attuned to these very fine differences. Um, and secondly, it's done, these this asymmetries are present very early on. It means that it's part of our human uh, uh, envelope, that we, will, uh, uh, we have these asymmetries, and uh, uh, we are prepared to process uh, this type of stimuli. Okay, that was my, I can say, my first part of my talk to say that 
contrary to what was said about an equic potential brain and, and, and uh, uh, all the fact that it was only the mature regions which are functioning, you see here that we have a lot of evidence showing that all this network, at least for language, they are prepared very early on and they are present very early on with all, all these asymmetries. So we have a lot of biological constraint on this network. So the second part of what I wanted to say is are the frontal region. You have already seen in our preterm babies that the uh, response were not limited to the temporal region, but going until the frontal region. So I want to give you other examples of this frontal involvement in infant cognition. So um, that was uh, the other story, uh, the other uh, study we did uh, in MRI with babies, older babies, so two months old babies. And again, you see here a very nice response to, uh, in the frontal uh, response to a sentence, a very short sentence. You have this very nice response, which is a little bit delayed relatively to the temporal region. So here we have really the impression that the uh, temporal uh, region is responding from the start of the sentence. So right here you see how it is pushed until the end of, of the sentence. So we have delay, which are much uh, wider in uh, infants relatively to adults, but still these regions are functioning. This region also, uh, this inferior frontal region, we think is involved in ver verbal short-term memory because when we, was, we were repeating the same sentence 14 seconds uh, after, you see that you have an increase in green, uh, in dotted line uh, here, uh, due to the repetition of the sentence. So uh, the baby, the two months old babies, was noticing that something was repeating. They were not remembering the exact words of the sentence, but something on the melody or, or, or something like that, uh, making them uh, uh, noticing that it was the same sentence. Um, another example of uh, activation in the frontal areas is here, in which we take advantage of the fact that some of the infants fall asleep during the experiment, while some others stay awake. And here they are listening to their native language, or their native language play backwards. And you see when they are asleep, nothing happens in the frontal areas, while we still had some activity in the temporal areas, so it's not they were totally uh, deeply asleep and were not at all processing the stimuli, but they were processing the stimuli in the temporal areas, but no more in the frontal areas. But when they were awake, they have a strong activity for the native language in this right frontal uh, um, region. In this third experiment, they were listening to their mother voice. I presented some uh, uh, of this work before. And uh, we have here a strong activity in the prefrontal, uh, medial prefrontal region when they were listening to their mother voice relatively to the uh, uh, unknown mother. And we have also, uh, sorry, uh, nice responses in the amygdala and orbitofrontal cortex. Now in the reverse direction, they have more activity for the unknown mother than for their own mother. So if we can resume that, is that in fact we have, uh, when they need verbal short-term memory, they activate the inferior frontal region. Dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, when they need to, uh, to pay attention to the stimuli or to, to, to have long-term memory uh, 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 reference. Medial prefrontal cortex for emotion, affective value, and so on. And orbitofrontal cortex for assignment of value in relation with the amygdala. So you see that, like in adults, depending on the task, depending on, on what they need, they will also activate different networks in the uh, frontal region. Again, it's not everything is activated, but depending on the task, like in adults, you will have a balance between uh, some of the uh, uh, of this network. For example, uh, this uh, you, you have the same thing when you have uh, adults listening to their own name versus a foreign name, they will have also this balance between the medial prefrontal cortex and the orbitofrontal cortex. It's a little bit the same with the baby listening to a voice that they know or a voice that they do not know. So uh, that's also an interesting aspect is that 
okay, until the frontal areas, which are very immature, but they are functioning, you have the information which is feed forward. The question now is that just the frontal area at the, are at the end of the processing, or are they able to send back the information? So do we have top-down modulation in babies? Are they able to predict something in their environment? Are they able to uh, modify to be uh, uh, what is happening in their sensory uh, system? So there is a very nice experiment published by a uh, uh, Dickaslin team. It was uh, already two years ago uh, in uh, PNS, in which they presented very simple experiment. experiments. They presented in babies uh, smiley followed, no, sorry, a sound followed by smiley. So babies saw beep, and after that saw this uh, red uh, circle. And they were recording the brain activity with NIRS in the uh, temporal areas, so the auditory areas, or the uh, occipital areas, so the visual areas. So when you have the pair, so sound followed by the smiley, you have responses in the uh, auditory cortex and the visual cortex. It is expected. What is interesting now is here. So now they got the sound, but no smiley. And you still have responses in the visual cortex. So you can say, OK, but they have visual responses in any time, so it's not a problem. No, because when you present to control babies only the auditory uh, sound, so they, it was not paired with a visual uh, smiley. You got only activity in auditory cortex and not in the visual cortex. And when you have only the smiley, you have activity only in the visual cortex and not in the auditory. So these things is just due to the fact that the baby was expecting the uh, smiley. So unfortunately, they do not have um, uh, the diode of a recording system above the frontal areas, so we do not know whether it is the frontal areas that uh, prime the uh, visual areas. But still, I think it's very interesting that these uh, seven, uh, five to seven months babies show this type of effect. So in another uh, experiment with uh, Claire, we try to understand what type of uh, uh, abstract computation can do uh, babies. So in that experiment, we presented uh, a word like gogofe, for example, which followed the structure AAB. Uh, and after that, he got, the babies got a fish. So they learned uh, during several trials that each time they have a word with uh, two syllables, two repeated syllables at first, they will got a fish. And after that, we present a second rule, which is ABA, and now they got a lion. In test, what we did is that uh, from time to time, we changed it. So they, they had 75% of the trials in which when they got Kimeki, they got the lion. But from time to time, they got Lou Belou, and you have a mismatch they should have had the lion and they got the fish, okay? And we had also a trials in which we introduce a new rule, which is ABB, to be sure that they have learned the exact structure and not only the fact that you have a repetition, an immediate repetition. So you see, we want to see whether they are able first to extract the structure of the words, and after that to pair the words with the image. So in some other way, to name the image with the world, <laughs> with, uh, with the image. And so what we look at is a, a surprise effect when you had a mismatch uh, association. So it's what you got here. So you have here the response to the congruent pair, the response to the incongruent pair, and so the differences. And you see this huge difference after one second. So it takes for them quite a long, but they were surprised when they were expecting the fish and they got the lion. Uh, and we look to a second effect is that, uh, so they know now you present the word, 
they wait one second before the image. So when they got a word like Babato, they know which image they should uh, expect because they have learned it. But when they got the structure uh, BBA, so the third structure, they have learned nothing about this one. It's a structure we introduce at, in the test part. So they should expect nothing because they do not know. 50% of the time it was a fish, 50% of the time of the, other, uh, of the other trial, it was a lion. And it's what we got here. We got a difference between this uh, uh, response to the word with an unlearned image. I mean, they, do not, they cannot expect anything here for the green, while they expect something for the two other. And you see this difference between these two conditions, between the expected condition and the non-expected condition. And I d you have here the uh, uh, amplitude of the response for the two expected conditions and here for the unexpected condition in the central part of the brain. So here it's uh, uh, quite surprising. I was not expecting that they were doing so much, but it means that at five months, they are able to distinguish three rules. So they have words which are sometimes babato, sometimes bato ba, sometimes uh, bato to, which is a uh, so very uh, quite abstract structure because they were always different syllables. So they can only base their uh, expectation on the structure of the word. And they are able to learn these three structures. They can uh, they show anticipations that modulate their uh, visual response, and they are surprised when uh, their expectation was not fulfilled. So it means that it's a very complex uh, chain of operation, of abstract operation. So I want to conclude here. It's not. Um, I have just show show you a little. Uh, 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 succession of, 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 of uh, results to just to demonstrate to you first that we have with brain imaging we can really open the black box of the infant brain and try to understand we are just at the beginning of this story because we, this, all these uh, techniques are very recent but we can now look inside the brain of babies and very preterm babies and so we can look at which brain areas are, are activated by such or such stimuli. And we can find that from start, you have a blueprint of all these networks that we see in adults. Really, we are organized from start. What is interesting, avec notably functional asymmetries, everything is working until the, the frontal areas. Um, uh, but what we need to understand now is what is important in all this uh, uh, network or all this part of the different part of the network and uh, what is the dynamics. I do not speak at all here about the dynamics. I, I signal to you at several points that the response were very slow, for example. The frontal areas, they are involved, but they are very slow. We have response at one second when we are using ERP, while in adults we will have them at 300 milliseconds. So you can see how slow it is. So we do not know whether it's useful to be slow like that or whether you know, it's, they are just slow because they are young and immature. But maybe there are important factors in that, in that di dynamics. So we will uh, now uh, um, study that, but for the moment we are just at the beginning of this uh, uh, understanding using brain imaging. Thank you very much.
and discussion. So I'll open up the floor to anyone. I encourage anyone to feel free to ask a question. Um, students, please feel free. Uh, we have a little bit of time for that. And at the end of this presentation and discussion, we also have a reception that's happening in the SLCC um, just across the way. So please, everyone in attendance here, feel free to join us for the reception where we can continue the discussion as well. So if you have a question, please come up to the stage so that we can make sure it's captured and interpreted. Thank you. I think maybe everyone has so much to digest that it's taking a moment, but Clifton's going to come up with a question now. We were more speaking about oral languages and uh, sign languages, but I think that some of this uh, uh, claim hold also for, for sign languages. For example, the importance of the frontal areas or uh, even the fact that uh, uh, we were discussing that with uh, uh, Lauren uh, Petito uh, a few moments ago about the importance of the temporal lobe for phonological uh, computation, uh, either with oral languages or, or sign languages. So we have to understand in that case what type of uh, uh, computation this particular part of the brain is doing and what are the differences between left and right. Um, I saw you briefly mention the maturational timetable in looking at preterm infants, and you saw that they still require additional time to fully develop, and so they're not depending, it's not 100% dependent on exposure and environmental exposure. So what have you seen in your work that would tell us about the context of language deprivation? Oh, when you were language deprivation, Deprivation, so, sorry. So in the context of an infant who is not receiving any access to language exposure, how might you anticipate that affecting their development? So would your findings based on preterm infants say that they would still require additional time even if they're, say, 31, born at 31 weeks? of gestational age, would they still require additional time to perform like a 12-month-old infant who was full term? So in the context of lang a language-deprived infant, what do you think your work would tell us? Um, when I was, uh, in fact, we we'll look with Marcela Peña to some uh, aspect of exposure versus maturation. Uh, in preterm babies. For example, we know that the, at the end of the first year of life, babies are losing um, phonetic contrasts which are not used in their own language. And we were wondering uh, whether it is related to exposure or uh, maturation. And in fact, we found that for that case, it was maturation. So the uh, babies born three months before were not uh, faster to lost that they were losing it when they were where their brain was uh, reaching 12 months of age but at the same time Thierry Nazi uh, did an experiment in which he was looking at phonotactic uh, rules so the fact that you can combine some uh, uh, phonemes in your own language that you cannot do in another language or you can do it in another language and not do in your own language and in that case it was duration of exposure meaning that depending on the on the on not only on the domain, because here you are in the phonetic domain, but on the mechanism which is behind, you may have different effects of exposure and of uh, 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 maturation. Some parts, some, some, some aspects are related to, to brain maturation, and some need exposure to be 
uh, maturing. And I think that the case here is interesting for deprivation because it means that you not only need to have uh, your brain maturation, but to learn the phonotactic rules of your own language, you need to be exposed exposed to your own language. So in that case, uh, in the case of the Thierry Nazi study, they need to have been exposed to French to, uh, to learn the phonotactic rules of French. So I think that uh, if, you are, if you are deprived, some of this network may still wait, and it's uh, what has been said at least for some part of the, uh, of the auditory system in death, that for example, when you have a cochlear implant, uh, some ERP component are appearing, while they should have already appeared because now you are too old. I mean, in every subject, uh, this uh, component has appeared before. So it means that here you are waiting for an, uh, an exposure, but some other aspect of speech need to be done at uh, a precise time. And I, we, you cannot answer in general. It's, it's really dependent, depending on each of these systems. I think that there is a very nice also um, study showing the effect of uh, uh, um, biological constraint on learning, which has been done uh, in Israel, because they had this very uh, unfortunate and sad story about a milk, which was uh, uh, during a certain time has no milk. artificial, uh, um, it was a milk for baby. Uh, and uh, it was a soja, a soja milk, and they, during the industrial saw that they had uh, sufficient vitamin within the milk, and so they stopped to, to add it. So it was a uh, tiamine. And uh, suddenly they got this uh, children infant arriving at the hospital with uh, an encephalopathy, so very sick children, and they realized that these uh, babies lose, uh, had no, no, not this vitamin, uh, because they were all uh, nourished by this milk. And they were tested, so some died, unfortunately, but some, so they go everywhere and say stop the milk, stop and change the milk. And uh, they were, so the other ones, they were tested at uh, nine-year-old, and uh, they had nothing ex except syntactic difficulties. So it's, and it, you need to have, uh, to miss this vitamin during only three weeks, during the first year of life, and it's sufficient to give you a syntactic difficulty seven months later, uh, seven years later, or nine years later, and you cannot recover. Meaning that some part of the linguistic system are very dependent on the, on the uh, biological constraint, and here on this vitamin, which may be involved in some of this network. We do not know which one. So it's true that uh, I am responding now <laughs> on the uh, biological part. So it's the half part of the, of the bottle. The other part is, uh, is, uh, is a stimulation, and I think that you need also the stimulation. Thank you for that. I look forward to further discussion at the reception after. I have a two-part question, kind of. Um, the first thing I'd like to ask is, of all the babies that you have studied, have you followed any of them over time? Longitudinal, how many um, have you followed over time? So you don't know later outcomes? There should be, at least, uh, for, for all the... 
except the fetal baby, but they are, they are all normal infants, healthy infants, so there is no problem, uh, no expected problem in general. So I remember one mom uh, out of uh, a lot of more than several hundred that says that, uh, that a, a girl was uh, diagnosed as autistic and uh, so, but otherwise none. For the preterm, they are followed by their, own, their clinical, uh, on, uh, the clinical doctors and uh, they have not seen or anything. But they are at risk uh, as any preterm of uh, language problem. And the reason that I asked is because I was wondering whether that population that you studied might have a diagnosis like autism, what you just mentioned, or another disability. How might that, if you were to find out that they had a diagnosis or disability later in life, how might that affect this work that you've already done? I mean, for the moment, we are still at looking at group, um, group uh, results. So if you are expecting, and I must say that we are not very representative of the population. What we want to have is the babies at some age and to, uh, to see how they perform. So it's true that, for example, for MRI, uh, the people who are coming are usually educated people with, uh, and parents either in the medical uh, research or medical domain or uh, researchers because they are interested by this type of stuff. So, I mean, we do not have the average population. We certainly have an educated population. So, it means that uh, it's true that we may have in that population the same risk that in a normal population of 10% either of uh, this something, Lexi, Praxi, Calculia, or autism and so on, but it will be uh, in, the, in the group. So we, I am not looking at each individual subject, so it's a group effect. So it's true that it may, uh, I may underestimate the possibility because I have some people who may be outsider, but we are looking at group. Uh, effect. What babies are doing, what healthy babies at this age, they have no diagnosis of anything, what they can do in this type of situation. For the preterm, it's a little bit different because we know that there are higher risk of autism, as you said, of uh, language difficulties. But here we are in uh, babies who are normally, with normal EG, no lesion, no difficulty, except that they are preterm. And so we know what they are doing now. We do not know what they will do. So it's true that some of them may be sick after. But I have no way to diagnose them at this age. And I have uh, no way. I mean, they are doing something. The group is doing something. If I have a null result, it will be different. But they are doing something. It means that at this age, they are able to do it. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk. No, it would be great to have, uh, uh, to begin to have uh, uh, individual diagnosis and say whether we can, uh, it is a little bit down with dyslexia that we, the Finnish people have looked at uh, ERP response to, like, to phonemes like we did here, Pata or Baga, and they, they know, they have shown that uh, uh, infants who, we, we, who will become dyslexic have already anomalies in their eventuality potential uh, to syllables. So after that, you can make norms and say, okay, uh, if you are with that type of response, you are at risk, and so we may intervene earlier. But it needs a lot of children to, have, uh, to be able to, to build norms. While here, we still uh, have uh, small groups, so it's uh, only group effect and not really uh, individual response. I have a question for you. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned how these early uh, effects of language exposure and um, the relationship between early language and brain development, how those provide a foundation for other higher cognitive functioning, like uh, numeracy was mentioned, um, 
I forget what else you listed there, but I was curious whether you can expand upon that idea. So from your perspective, from your work, how if language is the starting point or the foundation on which these other skills are built, or if there's a different type of relationship that you see well, no, with regards to um, how the sort of functional architecture is built in those early weeks and months of life. I do not think that language is a foundation for all the other capacities. I think that each of this network has its own history and its own calendar of maturation. Um, the, uh, but it's true that, for example, for abstract computation, uh, there is several experiments showing that babies are doing it before on language stimuli and on other stimuli. So what we do not know is whether language is, in that case, the foundation for this abstract computation that will be generalized to other domains, or whether you have a, a, a faster maturation of the region doing language, so it gives language an, av an advantage. It's very difficult to decorrelate uh, uh, maturation uh, from language being the first, because we know that uh, infants are very keen with, uh, with language. They like to listen to languages, to language, to speech. They, they are totally, uh, the environment is full of speech. So it's a very uh, um, frequent, uh, lovable stimulus. And so they are working a lot with it. And when, as soon as you put language in an experiment, in an infant study, you are sure that they will be interested. Uh, it's like faces. So we had an experiment in which we presented faces of cars. And faces, they stay 10 minutes with, uh, looking at the faces and totally absorbed by the faces. And you put cars and they are, they, they are not interested. So is that because faces is so uh, important for humans? Or is that because faces are just the most frequent? Is their mom is associated with emotional stimulus, etc., etc. So. The problem is that um, the same thing for speech is that we do not, we are not able to separate what is related to the environment to what is really due to the fact that this, the brain is uh, expecting this particular stimulus mm -hmm. and maturation and so on. And, and you have selected across evolution all the system to, to, to expect faces or to expect uh, speech or any form of communication. But it's true, what we, what we are looking at is more what, uh, what part of the brain is uh, totally involved in that type of, of computation and so speech-like <laughs> network, whatever, whatever its relation is either it's due to uh, uh, maturation or to the fact that it is the most frequent and lovable stimulus around the babies. Um, are there any more questions from our audience? Okay, well, we wait and see if there's a question. I'm going to bring a small token of our appreciation for you and um, either we'll have one more question or we can all head over to the reception. We have nice food and drink, so please come join us. If you have one more question, feel free to come up right now. <laughs> Just a little token of our appreciation. Um, <laughs> a little bit of Gallaudet flair for you, um, our Gallaudet colors, so you can remember us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I will fly. <laughs>